be starting a new section of our work where we're going to be learning all about the different groups on the periodic table. So today we're going to be learning specifically about the alkali metals. So we've got a few learning objectives today. We want to learn the properties of the alkali metals. We want to figure out uh, the properties of metals in general because there's a lot of metals on the periodic table. We want to know about polyatomic anions, particularly the hydroxide anion, and we're going to add some things to our periodic table. We're going to be shading in our alkali metals, and we'll be filling in the charge of the ions in column 1A. Um, before you get started, you need to make sure you have a few things. Um, you will need your periodic table. You're going to need some colored pencils. Um, today, you'll only need one, but overall, you're going to need nine different colors at least. Um, I really recommend colored pencils because you can shade in with them lightly and still read your periodic table, but we are going to be coloring, so make sure you have those. Um, and lastly, you're going to need pencil and paper. Um, I really strongly recommend pencil and paper for note taking because the notes that we're going to be taking are going to involve a lot of superscripts and a lot of subscripts and a lot of drawings. And it's not easy to do a drawing of a Lewis structure or of a planetary model in a Google Doc. So you really, really, really should be taking your notes on pencil and paper for the chemistry section because it's just going to be a lot easier to deal with. Um, so make sure you've got everything set up. And once you've got that, uh, if you need to go gather things, you can always pause the video. Um, once you've got that, let's continue. So just a reminder about some vocabulary. So we're going to be talking about groups of the periodic table. Now a group on the periodic table is a set of elements that share similar properties. So today we're going to be talking about this group, the alkali metals. Um, groups will often, but not always, be elements in the same vertical column. So remember, columns are vertical, and then those horizontal rows are actually called periods. Now, elements in the same period will have the same number of electron shells. Remember those circular rings that we put electrons into. But oftentimes, just because you're in the same period does not mean that you'll have similar properties at all. Um, elements in the same period can have completely different properties. But elements in the same column, same vertical column, the same group, will oftentimes have very similar properties. So, what's coming up in our class? We are going to be learning about the different groups on the periodic table. So when we're done, this whole thing is going to be entirely colored in. Um, and a few important notes about the coloring. Please make sure that you are shading things in really lightly so that you can still read what's written on your periodic table. The goal is to make this extra useful, not to black it out so that you can't read anything. Um, so make sure you've got your colored pencils set. So. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to pull out your notes. I want you to have your piece of notebook paper and at the very top create a section that says metals. And I want you to copy down each of these properties that metals share. So all metals, and metals pretty much includes the whole left-hand side and the whole middle section of the periodic table, um, and those bottom two rows at the very bottom of your table, all metals are going to share this set of properties. Um, metals are malleable. So to be malleable means you can hit them with a hammer and change their shape instead of having them break. So if you take a, you know, a sword made of iron, people shape that in a forge with a hammer where you can actually make it into different shapes. Uh, metals are ductile. That means you can draw them out into thin wires. So the wiring in your house might be made of copper wires and you can make wires out of any kind of metal. Metals are conductive. That means they can easily transfer electrons from one atom to another. The electrons can just sort of jump from one atom to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. They're very easy to share. That's why we were able to use copper tape for our paper circuits. Copper is a metal, and so that copper tape will conduct electricity really well. Paper is not made of metal, and it doesn't conduct well. It's an insulator. Um, metals are good conductors not only of electricity, but also of heat. And the last property of metals that you should be aware of is that metals will always form cations. Remember, cations are positive. They uh, have a positive charge. The name of a cation is always just the same as the name of the metal. So a lithium cation is just called lithium. Um, 
these are the properties of metals. There are going to be a whole bunch of groups that we look at that are metals. And that means that these properties are going to apply to every single one of them, including our alkali metals. So hopefully by now you've got this set of properties in your notes under the heading metals. Um, leave yourself just a little bit of room. And on a fresh sheet, let's go ahead and start taking notes on our groups. So for the alkali metals, the first thing you should say about them is they're metals and they have all the metal properties. So what exactly is the alkali metals? The alkali metals are the metals in column 1A. So that includes lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Uh, you will note that it does not include hydrogen. Hydrogen is not a metal. It's got really different properties. But group 1, the alkali metals is everything in column 1A with the exception of hydrogen. So what I would like you to do right now is pull out a colored pencil. And once you've got your colored pencil, I want you to lightly shade in. It doesn't matter what color you use, any color you like. I want you to lightly shade in those six elements. And at the very bottom of your table, I want you to add a little key. So put it under the heading metals and include a little box of the right color and call it your alkali metals. Um, when you are done coloring, so for now you should pause this video, finish your coloring, and when you're done coloring, uh, unpause it and we'll get back together. All right, are you done coloring? Let's move on. So first let's talk about the physical properties of the alkali metals. Um, the alkali metals all actually have really similar properties. Um, they're all sort of soft, silvery gray metals. So over here, this one is lithium, up here. Oops, sorry. This is sodium, again, soft, silvery gray. This is potassium. Here the potassium is actually stored under oil in order to keep it from rusting in air because there's a chemical reaction that it can do with oxygens. Um, this is cesium. You can see cesium is actually a liquid at room temperature. And this is francium, which is also a liquid at room temperature. Um, as you go down that row, their melting points get lower and lower. So uh, the first three are solids at room temperature, but cesium and francium are liquids at room temperature. Um, these are also really lightweight metals. So, and the farther up you go, the lighter weight they are. So lithium is the lightest of these. Lithium can float in water. Um, sodium and potassium can also float in water. Uh, rubidium and cesium uh, and francium are a little bit heavier, and so those ones are heavy enough that they can actually sink in water, but they're not much heavier than water. So those are the physical properties of these things. The other thing to note is that they are really soft. Um, I can cut any of these with a butter knife. Um, it might be a little bit difficult to cut uh, lithium with a butter knife, but I could do it. Um, sodium, it's pretty easy to cut with a butter knife, and potassium, you could practically, it's got the consistency of like cream cheese. I could spread it on toast. That would be a terrible idea, but that's how soft it is. So these are soft, silvery gray metals. They're pretty lightweight, and that's what the alkali metals look like. Make sure you've copied that down into your notes. Um, feel free to pause this now if you need to, and hit play again when you're ready. All right. So on to the chemical properties of these alkali metals. So the first uh, and most important chemical property, because this is the property that leads to everything else about the alkali metals, is that they all have one valence electron. Um, remember that when you reach the end of, the, of a row on the periodic table, you've filled a valence shell. And so when you hit the first element in the next row, that means that that element has one valence electron. So the key characteristic of the alkali metals is they all have one, exactly one, valence electron. Um, from that property, everything else stems. So you can see the difference between lithium and sodium and potassium is each time we go down to the next alkali metal, we're adding in another electron shell. Um, so lithium, its first shell is full, and it's got one valence electron in the second shell. You'll notice lithium is in uh, row two, hence the two electron shells, and it is in column one, hence the one valence electron. Sodium, which is the next one down, is in the third row, so it has 
three electron shells. The first one is full with two electrons. Remember that first shell is tiny, it can only hold two. The second shell is full with eight electrons. The third shell only has one electron. Potassium, again, we've moved over. Now we've got one more shell. So now the first three shells are full and that fourth shell only has one valence electron. So the fact that these things all have one valence electron is what makes them have such similar properties because valence electrons are super important. So I want you to take a moment and think about this. If they have one valence electron, what would an ion of an alkali metal look like? Remember that to form an ion, you either want to fill or empty your outermost electron shell. So with one electron, is it gonna be easier for these things to fill a shell by gaining seven? Or will it be easier for them to lose a shell by getting rid of one electron? And then if you get rid of one electron, what would your charge become? Got it? All right, if you lose that one electron, you have one fewer negative charge than you have positive charges. So all of these can form ions with a charge of positive one. So above column 1A, I want you to write plus one on your table. So right around here, I want you to write that plus one. Um, so fill that in on your periodic table now. Because the alkali metals all form cations with a charge of plus one, that means they're going to be able to really easily form an ionic bond with any anion with a charge of minus one. So all the way on the other side of the periodic table in column 7a, there's a group that's called the halogens. We're going to learn about them tomorrow. One of the things that's worth knowing about the halogens is they have a charge of minus one. So all of the alkali metals are going to be able to react one alkali metal to one halogen. When they do this, when you have an alkali metal and a halogen and they form a bond, the product of that reaction is something called a salt. So this is a technical term. You're probably used to hearing salt and thinking table salt. Table salt is a type of salt. It's actually sodium chloride. So one sodium cation, sodium is an alkali metal. Chlorine is a halogen. It's in column 7a. When it forms ions, they have a charge of minus one. So sodium chloride is table salt but there are actually loads of different kinds of salts. Um, and all of these salts are, uh, it's a whole big class of chemical compounds. And you're gonna, one of the things we're gonna learn to do is identify what kind of chemical something is. So one of the ways that you'd be able to tell something is a salt is if it has a, a alkali metal cation and a halogen anion, that's definitely a salt. There's other things that are also salts, but that's gonna be true for all of the things that I just gave. So for example, lithium could bond with fluorine, that would be lithium fluoride, that's a salt. Lithium could also bond with iodine and give me lithium iodide, that's also a salt. Sodium could bond with chlorine and give me sodium chloride, or it could create sodium bromide or sodium iodide. Sodium could bond with any of those halogens and create a salt. Same goes with any uh, alkali metal plus any halogen is going to be some sort of salt. Now let's talk about uh, the name alkali metal. So one part of that name is the word metal, right? Alkali metals are metals. They're malleable, ductile, conductive. They form cations. They've got all the metal properties. But there's a reason why they're called the alkali metals. Um, alkali is a term that's basically the opposite of acidic. So another word for that is uh, alkali basically means it's a base, as in acid-base reactions, which is something that's going to be coming up pretty soon, probably around the beginning of next week. So we're going to be talking about acid-base reactions. And the reason why alkali metals have this name is because they are really good at forming bases. So in order to understand acid-base reactions and what acids are and what bases are, we're going to go into this in much more detail next week. But the very basics are you should think of water as an ionic compound. In that ionic compound, hydrogen is a cation. So you've got one hydrogen cation. You also have a hydroxide anion. So hydroxide is something called a polyatomic anion, which is a really big word, but what it actually means is it's 
a negatively charged ion, it's an anion, made up of more than one atom. Poly means many. Think like polytheistic means many gods. Um, so a polyatomic anion is a negatively charged ion that is made up of more than one atom. And it turns out that if you take an oxygen and a hydrogen, those two things will stick together really closely and they'll act like a single anion. And you can think of that anion as having a charge of minus one. So if you had pure water, nothing but water, you would have the same number of hydrogen cations as you have hydroxide anions, exact equal number. That's neutral. It's neither an acid nor a base. But if for some reason you had extra hydrogen cations, then you would have an acid. And we'll talk about what it means to be an acid next week. But the basic what causes it is having extra hydrogen cations. Now, if you have extra hydroxide anions, extra OH negatives, then you have a base. And we'll talk about the properties of bases next week. But for now, understand that bases have extra hydroxide anions. So, hydroxide. Uh, hydroxide is the name for that uh, combination of an oxygen and a hydrogen, which have come together to form a single negatively charged anion. So, anions can be made out of multiple atoms. These are called polyatomic anions. And the most important one for you to understand, right now at least, is hydroxide, which is this OH negative. You can think of it as two-thirds of a water molecule. When Now that OH negative has a charge of minus one, right? There's a reason why it's got a charge of minus one. It's because oxygen forms ions with a charge of minus two. Hydrogen forms ions with a charge of plus one. So together it's minus one. You know, minus two plus one is negative one. Um, remember that these alkali metals have a charge of positive one. So the alkali metals can really easily bond with something with a charge of minus one. So if you take an alkali metal, it can bond with hydroxide. And when that happens, you create something called a strong base. As in, not an acid, but a base. So these are examples of my strong bases. You can see each one has, oops, let me pause this while I deal with my bird. All right, so the strong bases are made out of a alkali metal as the cation. So here we've got lithium, which has a charge of plus one, sodium, which has a charge of plus one, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Our alkali metals all form the cation. And then the anion, the negatively charged ion, is this hydroxide, that OH. So I've got lithium hydroxide. That's a strong base. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. Potassium hydroxide is a strong base. Rubidium hydroxide is a strong base. Cesium hydroxide is a strong base. And francium hydroxide is a strong base. The reason why these are called strong bases is because if I were to add one of these compounds into water, we would then have more hydroxide ions in that water, more of those OH negatives, than we'd have hydrogen cations. And that would make that solution, that mixture of water and one of these chemicals, into a basic solution, a solution that is a base. Now, when you dissolve these in water, it doesn't look like much. So chemists actually have certain things called indicators, which are chemicals that you can add into the water, in which will change colors if they detect the presence of an acid or a base. So one example of these is phenolphthalein. It's a big long word here. Phenolphthalein turns a beautiful shade of magenta if you put it in water and the water has a base in it. So if I had water, I could add phenolphthalein in it and it would look clear. But then the moment that I added a strong base, let's say I stuck some lithium in there, um, we would end up with it changing colors. It would turn magenta. All right. So the next important thing to talk about is the fact that bigger alkali metals are more reactive. There's a reason for this. Um, remember that these things form ions by losing an electron. If you are lithium, you're this really tiny atom, 
your electrons are pretty close to the nucleus. Remember, the nucleus has a positive charge and the electrons are attracted to it like it's magnets, right? You can imagine like planets moving around a sun. Now, if you're in really close, it's like that magnetic force is really strong, right? Being close to that, uh, it's sort of like if you're in close to, uh, to an object, the gravity is much stronger. Um, but as you move farther away, which happens when you reach these bigger atoms, that force of magnetism gets weaker and weaker. So it's actually easier for something like cesium or francium to lose that one electron than it is for something like lithium or sodium to. So as you move down the periodic table, we have more reactive alkali metals. So I want to take a moment and give you an example of the chemical reaction that the alkali metals are most famous for. So all of these metals are made of, uh, are in column 1A. You'll notice hydrogen is also in column 1A. Hydrogen is above all the alkali metals. That means it's less reactive than the, than the alkali metals. So one thing that can happen is if you take one of these alkali metals and you stick it into some water, then the alkali metal can actually kick out the hydrogen in a water mo molecule. So remember water, you can think of it as an ionic compound made of a hydrogen and a hydroxide. And what happens is the alkali metals basically take the place of the hydrogen cation. Now those hydrogen cations will form hydrogen gas, which is a flammable, you know, explosive gas. Think of the Hindenburg. Um, and the metals will come in and replace it. So as you move down the periodic table, the same reaction happens, but it just happens much faster and more dramatically the more reactive the metal is. So here you're gonna see that reaction happening the first time with lithium, which again will take the place of a water. Um, as this happens, you'll notice that as the hydrogen cations leave, they sort of are turning into a gas and bubbling off, the solution is gonna turn into a basic one. And you'll be able to detect that by the color of it. If it's clear, that means there are the same number of hydrogens and hydroxides. But when it turns magenta, that means that the, there are more hydroxides present than there are hydrogens. So that happens because the hydrogens are leaving. They're basically being kicked out by the alkali metals. So one of the properties that you should write down for the alkali metals is that they explode on contact with water. Here I'm working with some lithium metal, very difficult to cut. I've got a piece of sodium here, pretty easy to cut. You notice when I cut through that, that the fresh sodium is very shiny compared to the rest. Let's zoom in real quick and see if we can really get in there. So this side will reflect a lot of light. The other sides are pretty dull. And you'll see that especially with the potassium here. I'm going to go ahead and give this kind of a half cut. So for the potassium, this is the side that's from freshly cut, and you can see the dullness to the other sides compared to that one. So I'm going to go ahead and take those three, and I'm going to add them to water, and we can look at the kind of reactivity of those three alkali metals with water. So here I'm going to take the lithium and add that to the water. It's going to generate hydrogen gas and lithium hydroxide. So you're going to see a pink color develop here, and then you're going to see some smoke come off, and that's either lithium metal or that's lithium hydroxide coming off of there. Maybe a little bit of liquid water. But it's not as reactive as, say, sodium, so I'm going to put sodium into the next one. And the sodium is actually probably going to ignite. You'll see some orange flame, perhaps, or some sparks, or some shrapnel. And then the last one, I'm going to go ahead and put my two pieces of potassium in. So that's cut in half. So this is less potassium than the other two. In terms of amount, you'll find that the reactivity is a little bit greater.
Now that potassium there was quite quite reactive there, but the sodium sometimes will allow hydrogen gas to build up. In this case, it's not igniting. So we can try adding another piece here. And we can hope that that's going to go ahead and actually send off some shrapnel and some flame. All three produce hydrogen gas, all three produce hydroxides, there's your alkali metals. Next we're going to go ahead and do the rubidium and cesium. All right folks, so I hope that helped give you a sense of the properties of the alkali metals. Take a moment before you move on and make sure you've really got thorough notes, so make sure that you've got the properties of metals written down, make sure you have the properties, both the physical properties and the chemical properties of the alkali metals written down. So remember the alkali metals will form cations with a charge of plus one. They all react with water to produce hydrogen gas and a strong base. Remember that the alkali metals can combine with hydroxide anions to form those strong bases like lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, etc. They can react with the halogens to form salts. So sodium chloride is the classic, that's table salt, but you could have many other salts as well. Um, they could also react with other things. So you could have an alkali metal with a charge of plus one, and two of them could react with oxygen, which has a charge of minus two. So you could have something like lithium oxide would be Li2O, because you would need two positive charges to cancel out oxygen's two negative charges. Um, that's all I have for you today. We will continue soon with the rest of the groups of the periodic table.